Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's my first trip to San Antonio, and the weather was exactly as expected. I didn't pack, I didn't bring a hat, I didn't bring a scarf. <laughs> so it was a little bit um, brutal today. But I think it's, um, well, first of all, thanks to Miriam, to the foundation, the board, uh, for having me, and especially to Alice and Sergio, whom I've gotten to know uh, very well in the last couple of years uh, up at Wharton. And it's, uh, it's apropos to be giving a talk about uh, friendship, I think, in San Antonio, which, as I understand it, is the friendliest city in the United States, or at least it was a few years ago. And I hope you'll continue to be friendly um, tonight uh, with me. But um, we're going to talk about friendship. And so how many people here uh, who came here with a friend tonight? Wow, you guys all came with friends. How many people came hoping to meet a new friend? <laughs> OK, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to exercise your social brain, which we're going to talk about. So just turn to somebody you don't know and say hello right now. This is kind of that old church thing. <clears throat> this is the part where I can't get the audience back. You know, it's like then they're just off talking. So you guys were, you were when you were doing that, you were actually exercising your social brain network, which we'll uh, talk about. Uh, but, but friends, you know, we all, you know, friendship is, is really key to being a human being. It's a cornerstone of our uh, of our existence. Um, we love to be around our friends when you're sharing joyous moments uh, like these guys. Uh, they can define eras, you know, um, in terms of culture. And of course, they provide support and a shoulder to cry on when things aren't going so well. Um, but, you know, beyond that, we now understand that, in fact, um, friendships, having numerous or deep quality of friendships is, is so much more important than that. So we know that people who have better friendships, uh, more numerous friendships actually lead you know, happier lives, they're healthier, and they live longer, and actually they make more money. So uh, having the qualities that make you a good friend right, actually turns out to be really good for business uh, as well. And it's um, not surprising, in fact, when you step back and think about this anthropologically, uh, it makes all the sense in the world because we are really wired to be social. So uh, as primates, but in particular as human beings, it's part of our adaptive toolkit to come together in groups uh, and work together, cooperate, uh, to do things that we couldn't do on our own, like these uh, Amish folk, uh, and I think probably from southeast Pennsylvania. I always like to joke these are the, the guys putting up the new Comcast building in Philadelphia, uh, which is recently completed, and I can see from my house. Not quite that, but it's, a, it's emblematic of this idea that you know, it's a, it's, to have a barn is necessary uh, to be a successful uh, Amish farmer, and you can't build one on your own. And so you've got to come together and do it. And you're all doing something that's you know, decidedly unusual uh, in the animal kingdom, which is you're coming together in a group like this. You are hopefully paying attention to me, and hopefully you're going to learn something new that you didn't have to go out and discover yourself. Right? So this is all part of what it means <clears throat> to be a human being and to be a social animal. And we can appreciate the, uh, the, you know, just the, the, the incredible importance of the ability uh, and motivation to connect with others when we consider disorders like autism or schizophrenia or even social anxiety in which either the desire or the, uh, the skills right, that are necessary to form connections, to understand other people right, uh, are, are impaired. And so we know that this is an enormous burden on the, the individuals themselves. It can make um, life very difficult. Uh, and we know that it's, you know, it's, it's a huge uh, uh, burden for society as well. So if we could, you know, if, if any fraction of the work that we're doing could uh, begin to uncover ways in which we can uh, utilize all right, this knowledge to, to help these folks, that would be uh, a game changer. And I think we all now appreciate, and I've been, been hearing a lot from uh, the folks here in Mind Science, I know this will be a topic tomorrow, that, and on the radio show that we did today, that uh, it, goes much, it goes beyond um, right, folks who are having deeply you know, troubling uh, mental health issues. Uh, so we all are, I think, deeply and acutely aware that we're in what has been um, dubbed an epidemic of loneliness. Uh, you know, survey after survey after survey comes out and tells us that you know, half the people in the world say they've experienced you know, loneliness in the past year. A uh, recent survey came out and said that the millennials are the loneliest generation of all. I mean, maybe you know, one in five say they don't have a single friend. And they, we know that this is devastating. The consequences of not having those connections, of being lonely over a lifetime, translates into an increase in morbidity and, um, and, and loss of uh, life 
that uh, rivals obesity, sed sedentary living, and smoking. So it's been estimated to be something like the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So wow, if we could, I mean, that seems like a lot, but wow, if we could somehow uh, counter that trend, right, that would be, um, that would be a wonderful thing to do. And you know, I do have, as was mentioned, I do have an appointment in business school. And one of my um, passions uh, uh, at Wharton is trying to take a lot of the science that uh, the intuitions, the, the insights, and the technologies that are being delivered, de sorry, developed uh, in neuroscience and to apply those in business to make business more effective, more efficient, and more humane. And I think management is really ripe for this, right? So uh, you know, there's a recent um, kind of release of some uh, data from a study done by, by um, Google, uh, their Oxygen Project, where they had surveyed um, employees there uh, and basically did a kind of data-driven analysis of what makes a good manager, and what do you think it turned out to be? Good social skills, like high EQ, emotional intelligence. Who, were Google, who was Google promoting to being manager? Really good coders, engineers, you know, computer scientists. Not to say that they weren't necessarily good, uh, at, at, um, at interacting with other folks, but they weren't always, that wasn't always their strong suit. So I think that uh, what we are learning not only has importance for uh, health and well-being and society, but also can go a long way toward hopefully making business uh, work better and, and allowing people to uh, actually have a better experience uh, in the workplace. So when you guys were mingling with each other, what you were doing was actually exercising something that we call, uh, as a field, the social brain network. This is sort of a little bit of a piece of it. Uh, and this is really a major discovery over the last 15 years in neuroscience, which is that each of us has within our heads a set of brain areas, some of them here, and I'm not going to be able to walk you through the anatomy, but those green blobs represent some of the areas that, of the brain that are kind of active when we, um, when we connect with other people. So, and, and these brain areas, um, form a unit, if you will, and they're specialized to process information about other people. And so they're involved in the process of seeing a person and, un and seeing them as a person and then decoding their emotional state from their facial expressions, body posture, et cetera. And that information, as we'll see over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, kind of flows forward through this uh, system and kind of two really important things happen. One is uh, that there's a, a part of this system that's involved in kind of resonating with the experience of another person, right? So for lack of a better term, we call that empathy. But if a person that you love and care about experiences either joy or sorrow, we tend to feel the same thing. And we know that the, the kind of the degree to which you feel that is important for actually stimulating your behavior, motivating you to help somebody who's in need or uh, you know, sharing in their joy or learning something from them. And there's another component to this uh, social brain network that's involved in kind of the cognitive aspects of relating to another person. And these are uh, a couple of brain areas that are involved in essentially forming a mental model of what's going on in another person's head. So understanding uh, their beliefs, desires, their knowledge, what they think is important, and things like that. Uh, and together, kind of these two, you can think of these two streams of, of information as coming together to then shape. Uh, our re relationships with other people, whether we're going to help them, whether we're going to cooperate, we're going to cheat, whatever, all the kinds of things that go in uh, to normal daily life. Now, what's kind of remarkable is that uh, there's actually quite a few studies now that, um, that show that, either, that the, either the connections within these different nodes of the social brain network or the connections between them actually vary uh, amongst the general population. And in general, um, people who have kind of more connections with people in the real world uh, actually have a kind of healthier, better functioning social brain network. So it's kind of wired up more strongly. There's more connections uh, within and between these areas, right? And so that seems to really underlie uh, and be involved in uh, our, our ability to and motivation to make these um, connections. Now, all of that work, or a lot of that work, has been done uh, by looking at humans' brains, non-invasively, putting them in MRI machines and scanning their brains uh, and basically watching what happens. And those, those MRI machines allow us to take snapshots of blood flow to different parts of the brain, okay, like those green blobs that we saw in the previous slide. And that blood flow it reflects something about what's going on, but it doesn't tell us a lot about what's going on uh, within those areas because each of those blobs contains within it some tens, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of individual neurons like these little brightly colored balloons there. And those neurons are what are the basic building blocks okay, of, of brain function. 
And each of those neurons can collect information from different neurons, send it to other neurons, express different receptors, use different chemicals to signal. And so if we really want to understand how our brains connect with others, we have to get a little bit deeper than we can typically do using brain scans in people. And so for that reason, uh, we turn to uh, animals in which, which bear striking resemblance to us in terms of the importance and complexity of their social connections. So namely, in, in my case, rhesus macaques, other people work on other kinds of uh, non-human primates. But you know, the beauty here is that they share a lot of these features of their social lives with us. And also, their brains are basically wired up in exactly the same way ours are. And in fact, even many of the exact same genes okay, that we have in our bodies uh, and brains uh, operate in theirs as well. And so there's an incredible correspondence and allows us to get a little bit deeper. And I'm going to tell you a little bit here in the beginning about ongoing work that we've been doing for about 12 years uh, on an island called Cayo Santiago Island, which is off the east coast of Puerto Rico. And in 1938, about 400 uh, rhesus macaques from India were basically dumped onto Santiago Island as a kind of founding breeding population uh, and also for research. And they've been under continuous observation study ever since. And it's an amazing place to work because uh, the animals are completely habituated. You can walk right up to them. You can be as close as you are to each other. And they are not bothered. You can observe them. And we know everything about every animal going back to the beginning, the founding of the population. And then every fall, we do kind of a monkey rodeo, which you guys probably get here, um, a monkey rodeo where uh, we round up monkeys and we can collect various kinds of biological specimens from them. So we can get DNA. We can get other samples. And this allows us to really go uh, a bit deeper but in an animal whose, you know, whose behavior is natural. And so these, you know, these monkeys are really cool because they, uh, like people, they, they spend a lot of time servicing, maintaining social relations, so they groom each other. This is like going to have coffee or beer uh, with your friend. Um, and those relationships are really important. So uh, monkeys help each other uh, in a variety of circumstances, in particular when they get into fights, which they do a lot. Um, they are also status-striving little despots, and uh, they want to get to the top of the hierarchy because then you get better resources, better mates, et cetera. And they use these relationships as alliances that help them to get ahead. And uh, so we have um, literally, I don't know, about 10 folks uh, on the ground there at any time, research assistants who follow individual monkeys one at a time for about 10 minutes, and they record everything they do, and they just kind of work through the whole population. Uh, and so we can do things like this. So this is from a paper we published a few years ago, which is a map of the social network of one group on the island. There's 1,500 monkeys on the island, believe it or not. There's some, anywhere between six and nine groups. And in this, this is a map of the social, so this is like Facebook for monkeys. This is a social network. The lines that connect them are grooming relationships. Those are friendships. So you can see that there's some monkeys in the middle who have lots of friends. They're the popular kids. And there are some monkeys kind of on the outskirts who have one or two friends. And then there are those monkeys down there in the lower left-hand corner who don't seem to have any friends. They don't really spend any time with anybody. Um, and so this is you know, really cool. This bears a strong resemblance to what we see in human beings. But what we also found is that where a monkey is in this social network is partially genetic. Okay, so if you're a popular monkey, uh, your babies are probably going to be popular, even if they move to another group. And if you have a monkey on the outskirts, you're a loner. A wallflower, uh, you, if you have offspring, um, your offspring will have similar kinds of qualities. We also tied um, some of that variation to particular genes, which are in red, but it need not um, concern us here. So uh, what this shows is that we can, you know, these, these monkeys are very good model uh, for what we see in humans. And we're now uh, at a position um, in kind of the, our understanding of, of, re, of rhesus macaque um, brain function and structure that uh, we see that they have a social brain network as well. It basically maps onto the human social brain network. And we and other scientists have busily been going about studying the activity of neurons in these different nodes of the social brain network in these animals to see how they contribute to these different functions, right? And what kinds of different aspects of either the social environment or the physical environment or the chemical milieu in their brains might, might uh, shape and change the way that this network functions in a way that might be very relevant uh, for developing new therapies in humans. And um, in the last uh, couple of years, we've had this amazing opportunity to actually study uh, the structure and function of the brains of these animals, these monkeys who are living in nature. And so um, 
This is very preliminary data that has not been published, but I just want you to focus on two areas here in red, this ACC gyrus, don't worry about what that means, in mid-STS. So the top one is, uh, is this area, is one of the big areas for kind of empathy and, and emotional resonance in humans, uh, and the bottom one is this mid-STS region. It, we think, corresponds to something called the TPJ in humans. Don't worry about what that is, but it's a kind of theory of mind, making a mental model of other individuals. And the, the point I want to make here is that you can see that there's a line through those dots. Each of those dots is a monkey, and the x-axis is actually uh, how, sent, how many friends you have. So monkeys who have more friends, right, actually these brain areas are bigger in, and they're bigger because they have more dense connections. Okay, so we've, something we've seen in humans, but we can go a bit deeper in these animals because now we're beginning to look at how these structural, this structural variation amongst these animals is tied to uh, changes in the expression of particular genes within these brain areas, okay, which really gets us close to the molecular signatures of, the, of these differences uh, in brain structure and function. Now, a big question arises right now, which is like the one that we're all worried about, is like, is this all fate? Is this all deterministic? I, I told you already that where you are in the social network is partially genetic. Now we see that there's uh, structural brain differences um, you know, associated uh, with, with uh, how integrated you are into a group. And um, you know, the good news is, is that uh, you know, it's not all genetic, okay? So it's something that you can change. So even though each person, each monkey, comes into the world with their dial set at a different number, maybe it's a three, maybe it's a nine, or whatever, everybody can turn it up a little bit. And this is not data that you can really get from human beings. It's not an experiment that you'd want to do on your kids, which is to uh, expose, put them in different sized families, you know, and then see what happens. But um, my colleagues that I work with at Oxford have done the experiment in monkeys. Basically what they did is they took rhesus macaques who were living alone, they scanned their brains to map the health and integrity of the social brain network, and then they took those monkeys and they put them into different size groups. So some monkeys had to learn how to get along with one other monkey. Some monkeys had to learn how to get along with five or eight or 10, and some studies all the way up to 32 monkeys. You let them live like that for a few months, bring them back in the lab, scan their brains, and what they found is that those monkeys who exercise their social brains Okay, they had to figure out how to make friends with more other monkeys. These brain areas got bigger, okay, and the connections between them got bigger. So if there's one thing you can take home from this talk tonight is it's sort of use it or lose it. This is a muscle you can exercise. Um, if you are a person at the end of the work week who's like stressed out and your idea of how to get, you know, the weekend is like binge Netflix, I'm just gonna veg on the couch. Um, that's really not the best thing that you could do for yourself. And so I always tell people, like, what you want to do is challenge your social brain network. Get out, uh, go to the farmer's market, go meet people, go, you know, go to the symphony, whatever it is that you might do, and especially to meet new people, and that will actually exercise uh, the social brain. And you'll come back to work uh, on Monday. Um, I don't know if it happens that quickly, but you'll come back to work. If you're exercising it overall, um, you're going to be higher functioning uh, socially. Okay, so use it. Um, we have been um, now, uh, I don't want to say blessed, but um, availed of the opportunity to now take these studies one step deeper, okay? Which it, we know that uh, having strong social support and social connections is protective for people when they go through trauma, right? So if you, are, I don't know, if you've experienced a hurricane or you had some other kind of you know, physical or any other kind of, of abuse, um, having strong social support is very important to being able to weather that storm. And so, it, you know, I'm sure <clears throat> uh, most of you are aware of the fact that two years ago, Hurricane Maria, Category 5 storm, slammed into Puerto Rico and utterly devastated the island. These are folks from Puerto Rico uh, who had gone without food or water or any other kind of assistance for at least a week. Uh, they have no roof on their house. Um, that hurricane hit uh, kind of Santiago Island before it hit Puerto Rico. So it's just slammed into it. So there on the left, is um, three days before the hurricane, nice and green and lush. Boom, Hurricane Maria, the eye goes right over the island. You can see a few days later, it's utterly devastated. It's like a bomb went off there. If you, um, and when we have, I could show you videos from a helicopter we hired to, to go fly down there to see if anybody was still alive, both monkeys and people. And so the monkeys went through the same kind of trauma. <clears throat> um, it's a devastating impact to the island. 
Uh, like the people of Puerto Rico, most of the monkeys survived the initial um, devastation, but then they began to die at very high rates for the few months uh, thereafter, which is the plot on the right, which is uh, just deaths per uh, 100 adults. And you can see there's a spike after that red line, which is the hurricane. Uh, on the left is plots of greenery, uh, which was devastated, it's still devastated. Okay, so it's a really challenging environment for these animals to live in. They had to turn to drinking seawater and eating seaweed for a long time. It was, it was dangerous to get around on the island. They were losing their... Uh, social partners, and so this presents us with an amazing opportunity to try to understand the biological and social factors that allow you to weather that storm, and whether there are particular um, behaviors and practices that might um, be protective for these animals, uh, as we see in humans, but to be able to go one step deeper. And so what I'm going to show you now, this is kind of a cute little animation uh, for, I don't know, it's about eight months or so after uh, the hurricane, and this is a, what's on the left, those dots are monkeys, and they're not really moving around. This is a map of the social network, how tight it is. Uh, and what's on the upper right is a plot of network density. It's just basically uh, how connected all the monkeys are. So it's going up, and the plot on the bottom right is a plot of the Gini index, which if you're familiar with is a measure across countries of how equal people are. Right? We hear a lot about inequality. What's going on in these monkeys is that they are becoming more tolerant, more equitable in their distribution of social capital. Okay, so they're not being cliquish. They're not being every monkey for himself. Rather, they seem to be um, banding together, which you often hear about in stories of people who've gone through tornadoes or other kinds of natural disasters. But it's still going on, actually, uh, on the island. Now, this is only one group. We have to look at the data for other groups to see if there are different strategies and, is, and in effect, which strategies uh, seem to be much more effective. Okay, so I'm going to turn now from the question of kind of the structure and function of this social brain network, how it varies in kind of the natural world in these animals. I'm going to ask the question now, when we talked about those individual neurons, not those blobs of, of uh, blood flow to different brain areas, how do, how do neurons in your brain actually encode information about others, information that is relevant for, uh, for making a connection with other people? So, um, and I, I always love sports. Uh, examples. So these are, you know, these guys, um, uh, John Lester and David Ross, were incredible uh, pitcher catcher combination that um, they could, you know, uh, could only work together, right? And when they worked with others, they, it didn't really work out at all. So what is the code for um, for social connection? And, the, and we spent a lot of time looking at this uh, particular front part uh, the, along the midline. If you were to, let's see which way this is. So if you cut my head open this way and you pulled that side of my head out, you'd be looking in that way. That yellow part is this, this area called the anterior cingulate cortex, <clears throat> and it's um, critically involved in empathy and other forms of social connection uh, in humans. And so we spent a lot of time uh, studying uh, the activity patterns of neurons in this area, and what we found is that these neurons act like mirrors for the experience of another individual. So basically, a neuron there would respond in the same way to uh, if you got a reward, as I got a reward, okay? And that is really, really fascinating. In fact, we found that the quality of that signal, if that signal was um, greater, monkeys were more likely to donate reward to that other monkey. So it seems to play a very important role uh, in pro-social behavior. And it's very, these, these neurons, these mirror neurons for um, experience, are really kind of the living embodiment of theories in, in psychology that suggest that the way that we understand the experience of another individual is through simulation, right? We're simulating, we're understanding, we're remapping what we see somebody else experience in terms of our, our own uh, experience, which I think is, is really, really fascinating. Um, we're doing a lot more work on this, um, and I'd be happy to talk about it uh, later, but what I want to do right now in the interest of time is to turn to this other uh, big function of this network. Right, so there's the kind of emotional resonance part, what we just talked about. And the other is this kind of more cognitive, forming a mental model of another individual's beliefs and desires and knowledge uh, and, and goals, and which we think is critical for behaviors like cooperation. Right? So how do you know when to cooperate with somebody else? And this, um, this one particular area that we've talked about a bit already, this, this TPJ in humans, uh, STS in, in monkeys, um, in humans, we know it's activated when we uh, take the perspective of somebody else. So um, when we try to understand or see things through somebody else's eyes, okay? And the, the sort of kind of primordial um, function 
that leads to that is just sharing attention with another individual. So when a baby is, uh, a young infant is growing up, uh, one of the first uh, things that they do is they, they look at their caregiver and then they follow the gaze of their caregiver to whatever they are looking at, as we see uh, here. This is critical for beginning to understand the reference of words uh, that a caregiver is talking about. And it seems to be foundational for developing these other kind of cognitive skills like theory of mind and forming a mental model of another individual. Uh, we've shown that monkeys do exactly the same thing, and they do it with the same alacrity that uh, humans do. Um, and remarkably, if we use a drug to temporarily turn off this part of their brains, they can no longer uh, take the perspective of another, other monkeys. So they can't follow their gaze, they can't share attention uh, with that animal, okay? And then kind of, you would imagine that everything else might fall apart. Okay, so that's really interesting. It gives us functional evidence <clears throat> that this uh, part of the network is really important, right, for allowing us to, to take the perspective of others. And it's interesting now to think about uh, this behavior in light of, you know, some other aspects of what it means to be a human, which is that uh, we're all, you know, many of us are striving for status. Um, we are, we're trying to achieve more than others, and status can be definitely something that is, uh, is critical. And there's really interesting data from uh, humans that um, when we think of ourselves as being powerful, more powerful than somebody else, we don't take their perspective. So here's a, a, a lovely little um, image from work done by um, Adam Galinsky at NYU and Maurice Schweitzer at Wharton. And they just have, they've done a variety of different studies like this where they basically bring somebody in the lab and they say, okay, imagine a time when you were really powerful. Okay, write the letter E on your forehead. Or, you, or imagine a time when you felt very powerless. Write the letter E on your forehead as quickly as you can. So people who are feeling powerful, or even if they are powerful, write the letter E so they can see it themselves. Okay, people who are not feeling powerful, write the E the opposite way. Okay, from somebody else's perspective. And you know, that kind of sounds like one of these, oh, you know, can't replicate social psychology, businessy kind of things. But you know, it's been, I think, it demonstrated in a number of different circumstances. But we've also shown that um, something very similar happens in monkeys, which is that uh, low status monkeys uh, take the perspective of all the other monkeys. So they follow all of their gaze. And high status monkeys do not. So high status monkeys are like these uh, uber power people, and they just couldn't care less about taking the perspective of a low-ranking monkey, okay? Now, remarkably, um, being high power, high status, there's now at, at least a half dozen studies in humans uh, that show that uh, the higher status you are, either in terms of your self-assessment or your peer group, uh, the less activity you have in your social brain network, okay? It's kind of like when we actually injected a drug into uh, these monkeys' social brain networks to turn off one part of it. That's kind of what it's like uh, for many people when they're feeling, feeling very powerful. Think about you know, the boss who comes into uh, the building and you know, doesn't talk to the staff and doesn't relate to people around them, right, because they're just kind of up here. So um, I think this is, there's, there's uh, uh, some very important lessons, I think, to take home from this. So right now in the lab, um, we have been working on kind of higher order more complex aspects of mental modeling of other individuals. Uh, and we're looking at both strategic uh, competition, uh, which I'd be happy to talk about later, but I'm gonna focus on, on strategic cooperation, right, which is key to getting along in society. And one of the really the beautiful things about working with um, rhesus macaques is that not only do their natural lives resemble ours in many ways, but they can perform uh, exactly the same kinds of tasks in the lab. They interact with the world in the same way that we do. They pick up on games that are really complicated uh, because they resemble, the, I believe, because they resemble the kinds of computations their brains evolved to solve. So here's just a little uh, vignette of, on the left, <clears throat> I don't have the real monkeys there playing, but there's two monkeys playing a, a version of the classic game of chicken, and there's two people playing it on the right. Uh, the little yellow dot that's flying around is the, the purple monkeys where he's looking. Uh, and the white dot on the right is where the subject that we are seeing play uh, is looking. And uh, basically, the, there's two individuals who are driving these cars. These rings are cars that they're driving at each other. The tokens that are ahead are the, token, the, the money or the juice that they could acquire by going straight. There's a smaller amount for deviating and turning away. Okay, that's the classic chicken game, okay? Um, so if you crash into each other, if you're tempted by that big reward, then nobody gets anything. 
So there's, there's often a tendency to want to turn away, but then you're the chicken, you're the loser, and you don't get as much. But in this game, we add a twist, which is that white bar is a cooperation bar. So if both individuals, if both players can coordinate and trust each other, they can push that bar together and they can unlock extra tokens. Okay, so it's, um, it takes trust, it takes coordination, uh, but we see that both monkeys and people uh, do this. They do it quite readily. People are a little bit more cooperative uh, than monkeys, which is, is not surprising, um, but, uh, but it's there. And what we've discovered is that um, there are actually neurons, a population of neurons in this kind of back part of the brain we've been talking about that's important for mental modeling. There are neurons, so oh, we're, the slide didn't advance. Could, could we, so there's a big bar between it that's a little disturbing. Uh, canceled. I've been canceled. Um, only the young people got that, you know. The, uh, okay. Anyway, so I'll tell you about it, which is that um, there, we discovered a population of neurons that are selective for cooperation. That is what they respond to. So they respond to rewards that were achieved through cooperation and for nothing else in this back part of the brain, which is really, really uh, remarkable. And we know in humans that this area is active. Uh, when we're cooperating, sorry, cooperating with others, we did not discover those neurons in other parts of the social brain network. So it seems to be, uh, are we back? Uh, let's see, okay, great. So um, don't worry too much about squiggly lines, that's just brain activity, these are two example neurons. So the one on the top is from this empathy brain area, and we didn't find really any of these cooperation neurons there, but we did find them in this kind of more cognitive theory of mind area. It also suggests that to some degree, cooperation is much more of a mental, you know, cognitive exercise rather than something that's driven uh, emotionally. Okay, now I have to tell you there's a big gap between what we can observe uh, directly uh, in monkeys by recording from neurons in their brain, studying the, the activity of these individual neurons, and what we can see in human beings. But we have recorded EEG, which is electroencephalograms in people, basically putting uh, electrodes all over their heads Okay, uh, very easy in a person like me, so there's no hair getting in the way, but, um, and what this does is it allows us to pick up on electrical signals that are deep in the brain, but they're averaging across many hundreds of thousands of neurons. And what we find, don't, don't worry too much about the, the nature of this graph, but if we plot the timing of neural activity across the brains of two players, when they're cooperating, their brains are more in sync. Okay, so we see a higher synchrony in brain activity, and when they are selfish, they're not synchronized. And this is now beginning to almost be a cottage industry uh, in kind of social neuroscience, which is that there's, studies, there's study after study after study showing that um, when we're really in tune with somebody, uh, that our brains, and, and it turns out other aspects of our physiology, begin to synchronize. Now, we don't know whether this is a cause or effect. Is this just a marker of good team chemistry, good interpersonal chemistry, or something you can hack, which is what we're trying to do, to see if we can hack it uh, and make people more cooperative and work better together. But it's a really remarkable um, phenomenon. And I'm gonna return to that in a second. But in the next few slides, I just wanna introduce you to a slightly different topic, which goes to show how deep our wiring to connect is, okay? And these are, this is work that we're doing in marketing. And um, we are showing that, in fact, when we react to brands and to companies, at least for some of them, we, our brains are treating them like people, okay? So it gets back there. Was, I don't remember when that question was 20, 10, 20 years ago. Are companies people? Um, this was sort of more of a, a legal question. But it turns out that our brains respond to and incorporate uh, brands, uh, using into our kind of internal sense of self, using the same circuits that we've just been talking about. And so we've done this study where we've compared brain responses in uh, Apple iPhone users and Samsung uh, Galaxy users. Okay, so these are two, the two dominant uh, smartphone brands in the US, um, and we found obligate Samsung and Apple users, so they couldn't have a device from the other and uh, the other brand. And then we, they were lying in an MRI machine and we were uh, recording brain activity, taking snapshots of their brains while they uh, heard good and bad news about each of the two brands. Like, oh, Apple's profit soared, or oh, Steve Jobs died. Uh, well, that had happened a long time ago, but anyway, um, Tim Cook became CEO. No, um, so <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad. Uh, 
Same kind of thing for Samsung, and we asked people how they felt. And first of all, what we found is that people actually said that they felt something like empathy for the brand. So they felt good when something good happened to their brand and bad when something bad happened to their brand. At least Apple users did, um, not so much for Samsung. Samsung users reported empathy for Samsung, but also schadenfreude or, or um, reverse empathy for Apple. So they felt a little good when bad things happen to Apple, a little bad when good things happen to Apple. And that's going to be important next because we scanned their brains. And we looked at their brain response, a little bit of a complicated plot, but on the left are Apple customers, on the right, Samsung customers, and we got Apple News and Samsung News positive and neutral. And so basically, it's as expected uh, in our Apple customers, they're feeling something like empathy because when they hear good news about Apple, we see activity in parts of the brain that are um, active when you experience reward, when you eat chocolate, when you get money, et cetera, when you give money to charity, when something good happens to somebody you love, and we see the, the converse of that. When something bad happens to Apple, we see activation of this empathy for pain network, okay? So this is the network that's active when you feel pain and when somebody you love is suffering, okay? So this is exactly what we would expect if you were, you were actually seeing good and bad things happen to somebody that you love, part of your tribe. And we don't see that, um, sorry, in our Apple customers in response to good or bad news about Samsung. Okay, that's great, that makes sense. They are connected, they're friends with Apple. This is exactly what we'd expect to see. Now, the funny thing is, is that the Samsung customers are quite a bit different. Um, the CMO of Samsung has some work to do because when uh, Samsung users see good news about uh, Samsung, there's nothing, and there's nothing for bad news about <laughs> Samsung either. So they have not incorporated Samsung as a person in their tribe, okay? The only thing we see is that they show a little bit of pain when uh, they hear good news about Apple, and they show a little bit of reward when they hear bad news about Apple, which matches that schadenfreude that they reported, okay? So this is really kind of remarkable. So Apple's done something incredible over the course of the last 20 years, which is they built this sense of community, a tribe, and Apple, the brand, is a part of, you know, it's a part of who you are. It's a part of your, your family, basically, and your brain treats it like that. Samsung, no, that's not what we see, but the ultimate the ultimate take home message here is it's all about Apple. So Apple customers love being part of the Apple family and Samsung customers hate Apple. And they choose Samsung because they don't want um, to, they don't want to pay for it. There is the whole, there is a whole sort of social hierarchy status thing that's involved here, which is I think why they respond that way. And they want to denigrate Apple as much as possible to make their choice seem better. Okay, um, I got a lot to talk about, but I'm just gonna rip through it. Okay, so um, now, one of the things that we've been really excited about doing, as I, as I uh, said at the introduction, is to try to take some of these insights and, and um, brain measures that we can obtain and use that to kind of turn it up to 11, for those of you who remember Spinal Tap. Can we, get, can we improve performance, whether that's uh, you know, in the office, right, uh, at home? Um, and we've actually been looking at sports as a really great Petri dish for uh, especially trying to understand performance as it arises through team chemistry. Uh, and sports is a great opportunity to do that because the outcomes are objectively measurable, right? Unlike kind of some office-related management things which are a little uh, squishier. And, um, and small changes in performance can have a profound impact, right? It can be win or lose, get the gold medal, uh, don't, don't finish. Uh, it can be hundreds of millions of dollars if you're talking about professional sports. So we've been working with a lot of Penn Athletics. Our first study was with the Penn rowing team. Uh, we looked at training, dry land training in the gym and then also uh, performance out on the water. And we were really interested in this idea that I, I, I mentioned before about kind of physiological synchrony, right? And if any sport would seem to be um, tied to synchrony, it would be rowing, right? It's not all just about how hard you row, but whether you're rowing in sync with the other people on your boat. Um, as an aside, I'll tell you that's not how the coaches actually select people for the boat. They look at how hard people pull on the erg machine, um, and, and all, the, all the rowers are really not very happy about that. So we, uh, we, ha we have, actually, this is a, a different kind of talk I could give, but we developed our own um, wireless wearable brain monitoring system. We measured uh, EEG activity in these guys, uh, as well as heart rate and other physiological parameters. I don't have a lot of time to talk about, but what we find is that in their different training conditions, if we force these guys to row in synchrony with a big rod that connects their, um, their uh, rowing machines, then we see a lot of physiological synchrony, which makes sense. If they can train however they want, 
Uh, we don't see physiological synchrony. But if we just have them sitting next to each other on machines where they can see and hear each other, they tend to achieve very similar levels of physiological synchrony. And they experience equivalent levels of what you know, subjectively group flow that they would experience if they were forced into synchrony. And we're now looking at the impact on actual performance. We've shown recently this extends to the office. So I can't go through the details here. But we bring people into the lab. We have them uh, effectively acting as a hiring committee. And they have to evaluate candidates for a job. And there's shared information. And then some of the people on the committee have unique information. Um, and it's important for them to introduce that unique information in order to make the right hire. Uh, but they often don't feel safe enough to do that, or the social conditions are not right. And what we find here on the upper right is that under, on those committees that did it right, they introduced all the information, they made the right hire, and they got a consensus hire, uh, we see higher physiological synchrony. Okay, so um, we're right now trying to understand what it is that's driving that higher levels of synchrony. And as I said before, whether we can actually hack that through various kinds of interventions, exercises, intimacy building, which I'd be happy to talk about. Uh, I know I'm over time, but I'm going to race through the last couple of minutes because ultimately, I think a lot of this is a lot of what uh, we're seeing in terms of variation uh, in the function of these networks and in the, um, the quality of the relationships that people have are, are strongly shaped and regulated by a few what we call modulatory chemicals in the brain. So in particular, we've focused on oxytocin for a while. There's been a lot of interest in oxytocin uh, a long time. So if I were to say oxytocin to you guys, you'd say love hormone or something like that. It's a little simplistic, but it is an ancient um, peptide uh, in your brain uh, that, um, and that seems to do a number of different things. Uh, it's released during childbirth and when uh, mothers are, are nursing their young, to, and it seems to be really important for building that bond between a mom and baby. Uh, in humans, it's been conscripted for other functions, although it's a little bit harder to study uh, in people. But it seems to be important for making eye contact and may be released uh, when we have positive eye contact with others. We know that it is definitely um, stimulated by uh, appropriate social touch. So we actually, all of us, uh, have within the hairy parts of our skin, uh, specialized receptors that don't tell your brain anything except that you're being touched by another human being in a nice way. And those receptors ultimately lead to the release of oxytocin in the brain. Um, and that release of oxytocin seems to be very important for other kinds of social bonding uh, going beyond mother-infant, but to, you know, between uh, between um, you know, spouses and, and romantic partners and also amongst larger groups of people. Uh, a lot of the work in humans has been very controversial. Um, and we've been very lucky, lucky enough to study um, you know, in animal models as well. Because of these qualities, the properties of uh, this naturally occurring peptide, it's now being investigated in many dozens of clinical trials uh, here in the US as a therapeutic for improving social function in uh, you know, in folks who have autism or schizophrenia or other, um, other disorders that have uh, social impairments. Um, and the early data suggests that it does actually really have a positive effect in randomized controlled trials, which is very, very important. Uh, so it promotes eye contact. Uh, it allows people to um, be better at reading social cues and things like that. And of course, we have been trying to work out some of those mechanisms uh, in uh, monkeys, where if monkeys inhale oxytocin, we've shown that gets it actually into the brain. So we can measure it in the brain. The oxytocin gets translocated there. And monkeys show a lot of the same kinds of things that have been reported for humans. So it, it increases eye contact. It increases attention to other monkeys. It makes them kinder. It makes them more prosocial and giving. And it also flattens the social hierarchy. So monkeys, uh, rhesus macaques, who are the most despotic you know, critters uh, on the planet, uh, become basically these little egalitarian, you know, I don't want to say marmosets, but they are, it's, uh, they're a very different kind of animal, um, uh, which is really remarkable. And we've shown that. Not only if they inhale it, but if you put the oxytocin directly into that social brain network, specific spots, it has the same effect. So we know that it's operating through those very, um, those very brain areas, right? And operating on those neurons that we talked about, those mirror neurons for reward, and possibly those cooperation neurons. Um, not all of you are going to go out and buy oxytocin, although you can buy it on the internet, uh, liquid trust, and you know, spray it up your noses. Um, but uh, there are ways to get your oxytocin system uh, moving. Um, you know, so I, I told you that if you, you, know, you, you have appropriate social touch or you have positive eye contact with somebody. But you know, let's say you're going out 
uh, you gotta go out for the evening or you got an important meeting at work and you don't have anybody around or you're a little too anxious for it. It turns out that we've um, done this remarkable thing with dogs over the last 20 to 30,000 years, which is we've made them like little humans. So through selective breeding, we've made, that we've amplified their kind, of, their system for connecting with others. And actually it turns out that this seems to operate through some of the same mechanisms. So, it, uh, so at least one study has shown that when you have eye contact with your dog, this releases oxytocin in you and in the dog, right? Which is pretty awesome. So it's like if you need to go, if you need to be at your best socially, you know, what I'd say go find your dog. Uh, <laughs> And you can get in a little pregame, you know, before you go out, and you'll be, you'll be uh, operating at a really high level. Okay, so I, I know I'm over time. Um, th I don't need to read these to you. You guys can read these. And you can take a picture if you want, because that's the sort of the way to take that home with you. But uh, hopefully you've gotten a little bit of a sense of, um, of how exquisitely specialized we are for, for making friends, right, and for using those friendships. Uh, in really important ways. It's important to health and well-being and, and to success. And, um, you know, it, we're understanding a lot more about how this all works and how it goes awry in certain disorders and potentially how we can uh, turn it up, both to turn up your well-being but also uh, hopefully to help you boost performance. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least uh, give you a, a, a snapshot of my friends, the, my team, uh, although there's been, now there's a lot of turnover on that team. Um, but these are the folks who really do all the work, right? I'm just the chief spokesperson and fundraiser, and they're the ones who are, who are really the critical pieces here. So with that, um, thank you for, uh, thanks for being here. It's been great. <laughs>